Good morning, and welcome to the Church of the River here in beautiful downtown Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Sam Teitel, and I have the joy of serving this congregation as minister. Right now, however, I am away. If you are seeing this video, it means that I am away on parental leave because my wife, Sandra, and I have had our first child. Uh, so you, the worship service this morning will be led by a, a guest, by a friend who is gonna be uh, leading us in, in a wonderful service this morning. Uh, I am so excited to get to see you all again in person and to get to introduce you all to the newest member of my family just as soon as it is safe to do so. And Sandra and I are so grateful for all of the love and support that this community has shown to us and to our, our new baby. If you would like to learn more about the Church of the River and about what is going on in the life of this congregation, stick around after the video uh, service today and you will see information on your screen about uh, how you can learn more and how you can get more involved. And if you'd like to stay as up to date as possible uh, on what is going on in the life of our community, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our worship service will now begin. Hi all, my name is Kate Haywood, and I have been a member of the Church of the River for a few years now. I've very much enjoyed serving the congregation as part of the Capital Campaign Committee, and I look forward to bringing you a bit of an update today on the interior modifications that we see as part of our physical future in the years to come. So I am an architect as my, in my day job, and so that is a little bit of the lens that I have seen the project through. I uh, very much enjoy the kind of the architectural uh, framework that was set by the original architect Roy Harover back in the original design, and I'm very excited about kind of the, really the enhancements that are being proposed for the church that really uphold kind of that original design intent of the campus. And I look forward to bringing some of those kind of visuals to you today. So one of the main goals of the capital campaign is really to ensure that we are providing a, a welcoming space for all. That includes, you know, the congregation, members, non-members, the larger community, uh, and, and also bringing in folks that, that may find use in our space for, uh, you know, events of their own. And so when we think about our kind of most sacred space of the sanctuary, you know, you can envision different modifications from finish upgrades to updates to the systems that really make that a very comfortable space. And the, the main modification that would take place in the sanctuary is ensuring that it is accessible for all. So there will be a, a new uh, ramp down to kind of the, the entry facing the river so that, that all can access our sanctuary. The, the largest informal you know, gathering space that we have as a church is the Mississippi River Room. And that's where a lot of the interior modifications will, uh, will be seen at their kind of highest uh, kind of modifications in the future. And so if you can imagine walking into the Mississippi River Room and being able to kind of expand out further and closer to the river, it's going to be about a third larger than what it is right now to accommodate all of those different gatherings that I mentioned before. And the Mississippi River Room will, of course, have updated finishes, uh, but it will be supported by lots of enclosed storage for tables and chairs and, and other aspects that need to be stored. And then it will also be supported by a, a larger and uh, much more up-to-date uh, kitchen area. So for all of the, you know, the food preparation that takes place for events that we, you know, have previously had to thinking about, you know, kind of a catering kitchen for, for others who might want to, to rent out our space as well. 
And when we were going through the design process, we were really looking at, you know, all of those big scale changes, such as kind of the, you know, the large Mississippi River room that we could have but also down to the details. So thinking about, you know, a, a roll up door that connects the kitchen to kind of the adjacent corridor to allow for, you know, service of the kitchen to the church at the same time that the kitchen could be serving folks in the Mississippi River Room. So we're thinking big scale and small scale at the same time to ensure that this is a really thoughtful, you know, modification of our space. In the chalice room, which is currently adjacent to the Mississippi River Room, will remain uh, into our future. And so we look forward to seeing upgrades, you know, new uh, floor finishes, new furniture, things of that nature. And also a small portion of the chalice room will be allocated to providing uh, fully accessible toilet rooms. And really what this will allow is, you know, folks who have strollers to be able to stroll in and, and park a stroller or, you know, folks who are on are in a wheelchair or, you know, anyone who um, needs a little extra space. Right. And so so again, with the goal of being a really accessible uh, physical environment for all, this is a really important kind of piece to the puzzle. Seems small, but big and impactful. So throughout the other parts of, you know, the, the church, you know, you will see modifications to upgraded windows, to upgraded flooring, upgraded furniture, paint, so it will feel like all a new space. So I welcome you to, to join us in, you know, supporting kind of this effort moving forward in a, uh, a bit of a, I guess, a sobering environment that we are in right now. You know, it's really exciting to think through what our future can be and how bright it can be, both for the church itself and for our community at large. I look forward to seeing everyone soon. Good morning, Church of the River. My name is Reverend Aisha Ansano. I use the pronouns she and her, and I am so thrilled to be joining you for worship this morning. I live in Malden, Massachusetts, where I'm the Affiliated Community Minister at First Parish in Malden. I'm also a co-founder of Nourish, a consulting group that helps communities figure out how dinner church worship can serve them in these strange times. And when it's safe and welcoming to do so, again, I plan to start a community that gathers in worship over dinner. I love thinking and talking about food and community and spirituality. And so it is such a joy to be with you on this Stone Soup Sunday. I know that things are pretty different this year, but I hope that together we can still celebrate what it means to share a meal with our people. And so I call you now to worship. Come beloveds, let us gather at this table where there is room for all and nourishment for your body and soul, wherever you are coming from and wherever you are headed. Take this moment now to be here. Come, let us worship together. And we light our chalice this morning with these words from Katie Gelfand. We light our chalice as a symbol of gratitude as we celebrate the abundance of our lives together. In this sanctuary, we harvest bushels of strength for one another and offer our crop with the hands of compassion and generosity. In the authentic and gentle manner of our connections, we cultivate a simple sweetness to brighten our spirits. May we be grateful for the ways we nourish and uplift each other, for it is in the sharing of this hallowed time together that we are sustained. Amen. Which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died and will live again today. And this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and queens. And of the gay, great happening of the earth. I'll shift
tasting, tasting, touching, touching, hearing, hearing, seeing, seeing, breathing, breathing, and he lived in from the know of all nothing. Human merely being dealt by him. The story of Stone Soup. One day, a stranger came to a small village. He was hungry and looking for food. We're all poor here. We have no food to share. And I will make stone soup. Stone soup? We have never heard of stone soup. How do you make it? It's easy. All I is a fire and a pot of water. So the villagers made a fire. Then they set a pot of water on it. The water is hot. Now what? The stranger reached into his pocket and took out a stone. I'll just put this stone in the pot. After a while, the stranger Tasted the soup. Mmm, the soup is coming right along, but it can use salt and a few carrots. I have some salt. I'll go get it. I have some carrots. I'll go get them. The stranger added the salt and the carrots to the pot. After a while, he tasted the soup. Mmm, the soup is coming right along. but we could use an onion and a few potatoes. I have an onion, I'll go get it. I have some potatoes, I'll go get them. The stranger added the onion and potatoes to the pot. After a while, he tasted soup. Mm, the soup is coming right along, but it could use corn and a bit of meat. I have some corn. I'll go get it. And I have a bit of meat. I'll go get it. The stranger added the corn and meat to the pot. After a while, he tasted the soup. Mmm. It's done. All we need now are bowls and spoons. The villagers gathered some bowls and spoons. The stranger put soup in a bowl for each butcher. Mmm, this is the best, this is the soup, best soup ever. ever. After all the soup was eaten, the stranger took the stone out of the pot. Then he put it in his pocket. Thanks for the use of your pot fire. Now, I'll be on my way. The end. Thank you, Magda, Sarah, Nathan, Callie, and Rachel for helping us remember the story of Stone Soup. I know that this story and our particular ritual at the Church of the River is always a favorite of all ages. And we've heard the story so many times in so many different ways and so many different versions. And I think the reason we never get tired of it is that it offers so many ways to connect to the story. So this year, I invite you to reflect as deeply as you care to on where or who you are in the story. And does it really matter who holds the secret to abundance? A French soldier, a traveler, or a stranger? May no one be hungry again. You are beloved, you are important, you are powerful. 
Go in peace. Our first reading this morning is by the poet Joy Harjo. It's called Perhaps the World Ends Here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners, they scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it, we make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of that last sweet bite. Our second reading this morning is Abundance by the Reverend Angela Herrera. O oh, source of love and wisdom, source of life, great mystery. Help us to see the overflowing abundance of our lives, the abundance of all creation in which we live and are interdependent. Help us to see the abundance of love, generosity, and meaning overflowing in our lives. Help us to transcend our either or limited scarcity thinking about gender, ability, nationality, culture, and race. To see that there are myriad abundant ways of being and that they are beautiful in their spectacular array. Help us to see that there is enough for ourselves and all people and to live into that truth. May our blessings be multiplied through sharing them. Amen. I 
invite you to join me now in a spirit of prayer. Spirit of life, who is a piece of everything that is and was and will be, we feel your presence in our midst today as we gather in community even when we cannot be together physically. Spirit, hold our tender hearts as the news from the global to the personal tears at them. There is so much to hold in these times, Spirit, so much to help each other carry. We hold in our hearts all who are sick and all who have lost loved ones. We carry the sadness of the people and events we have missed. We yearn to be with those we love. Help us to remember, Spirit, that it is okay to grieve, to mourn, to recognize that which has changed in the world. May we hold all of these for one another to help make the weight lighter. And Holy One, we know, even in the midst of extremely difficult times, even when so much feels heavy, there are still moments of joy. Help us to recognize these moments when they come, whether they seem small or large, and to take the time in our lives for gratitude, even amidst it all. For the sunbeams pouring through our windows, for a bite of something delicious or the smiling face of a friend on our screen, for all the joyful moments we encounter, we give thanks and we lift them up to hold on to in the moments when joy is harder to find. May acknowledging each other's joys help to sustain us. In the midst of it all, Spirit, we take these moments to be together, to hold one another in our hearts, to hear each other's voices and see each other's faces, and know that we are a deep community held together in love. May our love for one another sustain us and carry us through until we can be together again. Amen.
For today's offering, we will share the plate with the Metropolitan Interfaith Association, or MIFA. And here to tell us a bit more about the work of MIFA is Arnetta Macklin, the Chief Advocacy and Engagement Officer. MIFA was founded in 1968 after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in our city, when a group of courageous religious and community leaders came together to promote healing and address issues such as poverty, hunger, and social injustice in our community. They help us fulfill our vision of uniting the community through service. Our mission, over 50 years later, is to support the independence of vulnerable seniors and families in crisis through high impact programs. MIFA's family programs help to provide basic services to prevent homelessness, encourage independence, and help to stabilize families. Most notably, our emergency services department helps to provide rent, utility, and mortgage assistance. We also have family programs that assist with emergency shelter placement, as well as rapid rehousing. MIFA seniors programs help promote independence, companionship, and the health of the senior neighbors in our community. The MIFA Meals on Wheels program helps to provide more than a meal, but that one-on-one -on -one touch and that hot home delivered meals helps seniors to stay in their home longer. We have over 1,800 home delivered meals that we serve weekday, as well as almost 1,000 meals that we serve at our congregate sites in 17 sites throughout Shelby County. We could not do this without our wonderful volunteers. Since the COVID pandemic, we have reorganized our programming to be online in terms of applications. And we've also instituted a My Phone Buddy program in which volunteers can call and check on our senior neighbors in need. Our volunteers are, and our faith partners are truly special to MIFA, and we're so grateful for the Church of the River for over 15 years of partnership. With that, we say thank you. And now the offering for the care and sustenance of this congregation and for the good work of MIFA will be graciously given and gratefully received. When I was a kid, dinner time was sacred. I'm not sure if my parents would have used that precise word at the time, though I think they would indulge their minister daughter in that language now. But really, it was sacred. My family ate dinner together every night. Not in a forced way. Especially as we got older, my sister and I had other obligations with school and work, as did my parents sometimes. But the basic assumption was that every evening, my family would gather around the table. One of my parents would cook dinner, and as we got older, my sister and I took turns cooking too. We would set the table, asking whoever was cooking whether we needed knives, forks, spoons, laying that silverware on folded napkins next to plates, placing wine glasses, usually filled with milk, at each place setting. We would pick from our numerous serving dishes, giving each dish its spot on the table, checking that everything had a serving spoon. And in the kitchen, there would be last minute tasting and adjusting. 
and we would carry dinner to the table piece by piece and sit down. And before we ate, we would join hands and say grace. We had three usual graces in rotation, and someone usually had a preference. Usually it was my sister. And we would join hands, we would sing that short blessing, and sometimes we'd bow our heads after, just for a moment, not all of us, not every week. And when my grandparents were in town for Christmas, we would sing an Advent hymn as grace every night. My grandpa starting us off with his perfect pitch, and my grandmother singing alto as she always does. And when it was time to eat, we would serve what was in front of us and pass it to the next person. And the rule was that we had to each eat one serving of everything. And I was mostly okay with this, except for peas, which at the time I would swallow whole, and I still do. That's my little secret. But for a long time, my sister was a picky eater. And so we'd spend a lot of nights lingering at the table after everyone was done, waiting for her to finish. And as we passed our food and ate dinner, we shared two things with each other, something that had happened in our day and something that we were thankful for. I honestly have no idea how either of these started. They have happened at our dinner table for as long as I can remember. Sometimes this was a way to share big news with each other, but more often than not, we were sharing those little mundane things, just checking in and letting each other know how we were doing. Sometimes the things we were thankful for related to the thing we wanted to share for our days and other times, just another small snapshot into our lives. Like I said, my sister often was the one who lingered the most over her plate. And as a kid, I was frustrated when she, when she was there and we had to wait at the table. But looking back, I'm so glad for those extra minutes. At the end of the meal, my sister and I would ask to be excused and we'd carry our dishes to the kitchen and clear the table. Dinner time was sacred. And it's been a really long time since my family ate dinner like this. As I started high school and my sister started middle school, we had more and more plans in the evening, soccer practice and swim meets, chorus concerts and dinners with our friends and our boyfriends. I moved away to college and my parents got divorced. My sister and mom spent a semester abroad. My dad moved out. People and families evolve and change. And that sacred dinner ritual is not one that my family practices anymore. But eating dinner with my family in that way will always be one of my fondest memories, one of the most sacred spaces in my life. In the book, Consuming Passions, The Anthropology of Eating, anthropologists Peter Farb and George Armilagos present a simple statement. To know what, where, how, when, and with whom people eat, they say, is to know the character of their society. In other words, by looking at what our practices are around the table, we can learn a lot about ourselves and the societies, cultures, and contexts in which we exist. Eating is something we all do by virtue of being human, but we do not eat in the same ways. Different cultures and societies have their own norms and traditions on how they eat. Around the world, people sit at the table or on the floor. We use forks or chopsticks or bread or our hands to put food in our mouths. We eat in silence or with conversation. We eat somberly or with raucous laughter. And we certainly don't all eat the same things. What is normal food in one culture, raw pickled herring, whale blubber, lunch meat, is met with confusion and sometimes even disgust from those from a different culture. What is enjoyed for breakfast in one country is strictly dinner food in another and not ever on the menu in yet another. But however we eat, whatever we eat and wherever we eat, 
Around the world, families, tribes, friends, and religious communities gather time and time again over food. Food is used to celebrate and to comfort in good times and in hard times. When a baby is born, friends and neighbors rush over with food. When someone dies, it is the same. Being fed is an intimate act of being cared for, being nourished not only physically but emotionally. Being gathered around the table with someone makes them feel like family to me. Even without all the rituals that my family had around the dinner table, sharing a meal with people just feels right. We are there to do the same thing, to eat. But not just to eat, to laugh, to savor, to linger, to connect. And this year, things are different. This year, we can't just have an impromptu dinner around our friend's kitchen table or plan elaborate holiday meals where we invite more and more people. And as the days get shorter and the weather gets colder, as we get closer to the times when we might typically gather around the table with our loved ones, it might be hard right now, thinking about all the ways things have to change this year so that we are able to keep each other safe. It's hard, but it's still possible to gather around the table. We just need to get creative. I have had family dinners in the last seven months. I had a Passover Seder with my partner's extended family over Zoom, spanning seven households in six different states. We had Easter dinner with my mom and sister. And I've hosted pancake brunch churches on Zoom for a couple different congregations where we gather and have conversations and eat together. I've done other things too, things that don't involve sitting around an actual table and eating a meal at the same time, but things that still have that essence of what it means to gather at the table. What would it be like to have a Zoom call with your friends, to all cook the same thing and eat it together and talk and get to know each other even better? Maybe you could use a soup recipe from the digital cookbook. You could give your meal a theme or a topic, sparking some conversations from the silly to the deep. Or maybe you can drop off a meal to someone you know someone who would get joy and support from not having to cook dinner for a night or two? Can you order takeout to be delivered to a friend who is so far away, but who you want to send just a little love? Maybe you have a delicious cookie recipe that you can put in the mail along with a cute cookie cutter to some kids you know who need something to do and would enjoy a tasty treat. Sharing a meal with others isn't just sitting about around the table, eating. It is a deeply vulnerable thing to do, and it feeds more than just our bodies. It fills more than just our bellies. And in these times when we cannot gather in the same place, we can still invoke what it feels like to gather in community, to break bread together. The stone soup story, is about people eating together, yes. But it's about people putting what they have together, taking what might feel small on an individual basis and combining it into something that is so much greater than the sum of its parts. It's about sharing the abundance that we have with each other. It's about coming together around the table for nourishment of our bodies and spirits. And it reminds us that together, we can create something that cares for us all. And so in these times, caring for us all means not gathering physically at the table. But let's think about the ways we can carry that feeling of being together and sharing a meal into other ways of being. Let us gather around the table. It may look different, but it can nourish us nonetheless.
Go out into the world with the creativity to reimagine what it means to share a meal. And may we nourish one another in body and in spirit. Go in peace and go in love. Amen. Talk with